So, uh, welcome Peter Combs. Well, it's a dubious uh, <laughs> song to, to, be, to be quoted as saying we don't know what we're doing in it, so it's a 45 minute speech, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do to, to, to dispel that myth that we don't know what we're doing. But it is, I mean, it's partly true, right? It's, uh, it's something that um, we will uh, we'll use, we'll stand behind research, and the research has been done um, in one community. Uh, in one place that may be a lot different than your experiences here in Seattle, and I'll give you some examples of that. But by standing behind that research that's been peer-reviewed, we'll say, well, that's the national standard, and that's the way it's going to be. So there is some uh, there is some truth to that that I think that uh, that sometimes we don't know what we're going to do. So uh, I, I put together this uh, presentation actually, gosh, about a year ago now. Uh, we have a Oregon Active Transportation Summit that uh, we do down in, uh, down in Salem, down in our capital, to talk to basically all the folks across the state about what we're doing in transportation. And uh, in an active transportation summit, they didn't want to hear about signal timing. They didn't want to hear about the latest in thermoplastic. So I thought, I, I thought of a catchy title and got a couple of my traffic engineering friends and said, let's, let's talk to them about what we need from, from the advocacy community. What do we need and, and where, are we, uh, where do we think we've got it right and where do we think we need help? So, this is, uh, this is part of that. So let me start. Uh, the, 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 this morning uh, in the presentation, there was a disclaimer on the, on the, uh, the Puget Sound uh, Regional Council documentation that basically said, this, this speaker knows nothing about anything, and so you can't use uh, anything that he says uh, for any purpose. And that was a perfect segue to uh, what I usually say is, usually these presentations, this is not the views of the city. Uh, these are my personal views. But uh, it is based on some fact and uh, that we, uh, principles that we use in the city. But I will talk start about, start out with uh, uh, if there's a great uh, you, I was trying to get online to find it, but there's a great uh, YouTube uh, video on conversations with an engineer. If we have time, maybe I'll play it uh, tonight. But there's these two little robot voices, and, and basically the engineers uh, describing what they're doing with this roadway widening project and this. This other, this other uh, uh, character in the video says, but you're widening the street in front of my house. You're going to take my front yard. And the engineer says back, wow, that's improving the safety. And uh, the other character says, well, my, my kid plays in the front yard. How is that going to improve the safety? And it goes on and on. And anyway, it's one of those things I think engineers, we always have a, we always have a good uh, reason why we're doing this. But sometimes our reason isn't necessarily what your objective is. And sometimes it doesn't even align with our policies. So you got to think about, start with the policy, start with that in mind. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about what is our policy in Portland. So I like this quote, I, I used it this morning, but this is from our, uh, our, our, our previous mayor, uh, Mayor Sam, Sam Adams. And uh, his, he was speaking to a bike, he was speaking to a bike community uh, group, uh, actually I think it was in Toronto. But he was basically trying to establish um, what we're doing in Portland. And, and, and the comment is this. It's our intentions are to be as sustainable a city as possible. That means socially, that means environmentally, and that means economically. So kind of the triple bottom line. The bike is great on all three of those factors. You just can't get a better re transportation return on your investment than you get with promoting bicycling. And, you know, if you think about it from a efficiency standpoint, the bicycle is one of the most efficient forms of transportation you can ever dream of. And, and so from an engineering standpoint, if we think about efficiency, if you go back to the rules of engineering, that really speaks to me as an engineer of I want to try to move people efficiently, and, and so the bike is great on all three of those aspects. And let me stop actually by and, and say, if you have a question, feel free to stop me. I don't want to make this a monologue for, for 30 minutes. I, I want this to be interactive. So if you have if you want to dispute, if you want to ask a, a question, feel free to do that. Just raise your hand and, or yell at me and, and tell me to stop talking. <laughs> um, so policies, policies. I, engineers, we learn little about policies as, uh, as we go through uh, our curriculum. And I'll, I'll tell you a specific example about that. But what our, where it hit home to me was when I, um, when I, I grew up in Portland. So I'm a native Portlander. Um, so you'll have to excuse my, uh, my poking fun at Seattle every once in a while, because it's a natural, natural thing for me to do. Uh, but where I first found that I realized that uh, policy may be different uh, where, where everybody, where, where you live, is when I went to grad school. 
and my graduate degree was in College Station, Texas. And things are a little different. <laughs> um, and, and so their view on transportation, of course, this was a, uh, back in back in just a few years ago, uh, was, uh, was really the Houston model was still, they were trying to build their way out of congestion. They were trying to build freeways from here to Dallas, if you will, and trying to allow suburban sprawl to occur. In fact, they didn't have any zoning, so really anybody could build anything anywhere. And, you know, and it, you may have heard some stories of how this hasn't worked out so well for Texas, for Houston specifically. And so that's something that, when I went to Texas, I realized that, um, boy, Portland really has uh, done a lot of things right. And so I think about the policies a lot when I think about engineering. But that's not a common trait of engineers, because we really didn't learn much about the policy side. We're not political animals <coughs> in, our, in, our, in our early, in our curriculum. Um, you think about the classic engineer, how do you know an extroverted engineer? He's looking at your shoes. <laughs> That's kind of a classic engineering joke. So policies are really important if you think about how it informs your engineering um, design. And so there's a lot of different policies. So we have a regional plan, um, we have a climate action plan, which is by the county and the city. We have city transportation plans for all these different modes, and then we have a transit plan. So when you think about the competing objectives, all of these plans are on the basic network of streets. And if you think about the layers, we've got five or six different things telling me what I should be doing for the street. So I might have a street that I'm supposed to be really friendly for buses and good for bikes and excellent for freight. Hard to be everything to everybody. So that's one of the things that we find ourselves dealing with is, is trying to balance those various needs. And as an engineer, sometimes I just go back to my engineering standards and not look at the policies because that's safer. That's, that's more comfortable for me. I don't have to talk to anybody. I can just use my policies and standards. Okay, but that's, the real, that's not the real world. That's my fictitious little engineering world. One of the policies, one of the uh, aspects of policies that, I, that, that, engine, that speaks to me as an engineer is numbers. Okay? Anytime you boil things into numbers, I get excited. Okay, so I can measure things, I can, I, I'm going to try my best to meet your targets. And so, mode split targets is something that's very, uh, very relevant. Um, Portland, we talk about ourselves, the best bike lane, biking city in, in America, right? Our mode split is 6%, uh, and actually the household survey from the auditor said 8%. So, um, um, that's, that's fantastic, that's really very good. Now, we, so if we think about the U.S., that's very good. But if you look at the, in the Netherlands or over in Europe, that's just that's just middling, right? We're just we're just we're just uh, we're just getting started. Um, communities in the Netherlands, it'd be it's a uh, there are some communities in the Netherlands that are forty percent, and others that are uh, that are that are a bad community like Rotterdam is in fifteen percent range. So I mean, if you think about it, um, we have a long ways to go to to meet that standard. But that's our current mode split, and then we have four percent for walking. 15% uh, for transit, 66% drive alone. Hmm. So we set targets for 2030. So anybody want to guess what our 2030, year 2030 mode split target is for bikes? Okay, 20 people over here in the morning can't answer. <laughs> 20%. 20%. Well, that's, that's not, that's good. Not European, good. 15? Good double? That seems reasonable. Anybody else want to major a guess? 25 Come on, we're Portland. We gotta get to 25. <laughs> All right, we want to be European good. We want to be Dutch good. Okay, 25 percent is our goal. How is this for the in time, with the city limits of Portland people who live in the city, or, the people who or the city. work in the city, or the city proper, or the city proper, for people who live there? That's right. That's right. So the households for for everybody that the city cares about. We don't care about anybody outside the city. We care about just anybody. <laughs> so the city proper, right? So that's who they that's who they survey to check in to see how we're doing. So if you think about it, how do we get twenty five percent? That's the new question in Portland: is how do we get to twenty five percent? Now, can we get to twenty five percent? It's gonna be tough. It's an aspirational goal, right? Twenty five percent is that realistic? I don't know. But if you don't put that number out there, then how do you get the design engineers? to think about what's going to happen when we triple bike, bike mode split. Okay, do we really want, what do we want this to be look like? Do we want it to look like Houston or do we want to look at more like Copenhagen or more like, more like uh, communities you find in the Netherlands? Okay. So 
And, and of course, the outcomes of that, this actually, this is most of the target is from the Climate Action Plan. So it's really driven by the environmental goals, mm -hmm. trying to reduce the overall carbon <coughs> Uh, within the transportation sector uh, of the city. Okay. So anybody want to, anybody think that's crazy, 25%? Now you're all advocates, you're like, yeah. 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 As a designer. Why are those 30% still driving alone? That's what yeah. I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 um, Actually, that's the same 66%. Mm -hmm. We're going to grow, and you're not going to get those people out of their cars. No, just <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> but actually, there's some there's an honesty to that, right? Yeah. Think about. Um, I would, we used to say we're not building any bridges, but it looks like we may be building bridges. <laughs> uh, but of course, getting into downtown, um, there is a new bridge. It's a bike head transit bridge. No new car traffic on that bridge. But if you think about it, our bridges uh, to, to get in downtown are pretty congested. Um, in the in the peak peak period, so trying to get more cars over that over the existing bridges is not really a good strategy because they're pretty full right now. So how do you improve accessibility to the downtown? How do you get more people to their jobs? The bike is great in that regard. We're trying to increase walking, so that's of course density. We're trying to double the walk mode split, um, increase transit. Um, one of the challenges of increased transit is increased costs associated with with operating the service. So we have some challenges in that regard too. Does most of the into consideration distance travel? So no. so you could do you know ten percent of your ride on the bus and then 10, you know ninety percent on your bike or No, it's just a survey of, of, of households within the city. Good correct good question though. So is this like more people self report as that primary mode basically? That's right. That's right. Okay. We also have the, so the climate plan talked about, or climate action plan talks about some various things, and is a it is a transportation engineer. Not it's not very informative, so I had to dig in deep to talk about. There's one broad goal: urban form of mobility. Um, one of those is create vibrant 20 minute neighborhoods, and I'll talk a little about more about that later on. What does that mean to me as a transportation transportation guy? Reducing vehicle miles traveled. That's part of the climate action plan. Improve efficiency of freight movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to think about freight as well, um, and then other non-transportation operations objectives. But a real focus on health, public health, which is not something as a transportation engineer I ever learned about. Um, I don't think, I think my last health class was junior year in high school. Okay, so health is a new topic for us as, as engineers. We never, we really, health is an emerging, emerging area for us. Um, as is equity. Equity is something that... Uh, boy, four, four or five years ago, I don't know that I spent much time thinking about it. But now that I'm at the city, after leaving private practice, I really think about equity a lot uh, more in my day-to-day -day operations. What does equity mean? Equity means um, uh, trying not to... Uh, oh, I'm not equity. I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have a hard time describing it. <laughs> and I'd probably screw up the official description. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Oh, it's, <laughs> it's uh, trying not to disadvantage, dis, disadvantage uh, elderly populations, but that's something I heard today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've talked more about race in Portland um, than, than we have age, um, so that's a, that's a new one for me, and then also income levels. Mm -hmm. So trying to make sure that uh, we're, not, uh, we're not just spending all of our energy in the, in the most affluent neighborhoods, but really trying to do a better job of, uh, of sharing those resources. How did I do on that? Is that all right? Really good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did somebody write that down for that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, got, it's on the record, so now I'm in trouble. <laughs> when you talk about health, are you talking about physical health or mental health as well? Uh, well, they think, you know, pretty linked, right? I mean, I, uh, there's some good studies showing that uh, if, you don't have, if you don't have the physical health component, then your mental health is suffer. So, uh, but, but certainly, uh, and again, I'm not a health expert, but uh, I, I know some good ones. Uh, I can talk to you more about that. Um, so yeah, health is, is something, certainly from an obesity standpoint, we can, there's some great mapping that you can do to look at the direction we're going and, and, and as, a, as, a, as a nation, and, and it's, it's not in the right direction in terms of levels of obesity and all the health risks associated with that. 
Okay, so transportation hierarchy. So this is one of our intersections in Portland, um, and the transportation hierarchy comes out of the Climate Action Plan. So this is not new, this is not novel for Portland, we just have actually formally have it in a plan now, where it puts pedestrians on the top of the hierarchy, bicycles at second, public transit, you gotta think about public transit, commercial vehicles, high capacity vehicles, and single occupancy vehicles. Obviously from a, from a carbon standpoint, this makes sense, right? It doesn't take much energy for a pedestrian to, to, uh, to, to go where they're going. Um, from a, from a, also from a vulnerability standpoint, pedestrians and bikes, of course, up on the top. Okay. So this street in downtown Portland, let's just go through the modes and look at them quickly. So on the, on the we have sidewalks on both sides of the street, nice ample sidewalks. Um, so for pedestrians, we get, a, we get a check mark there. For bikes, we used to have, we had two lanes of traffic. We actually converted one of those lanes into a buffered bike lane. We have a, because we're, because we're engineers and we do things on the cheap, we, we did just a little green bit in the start and tried to see if that would work and actually we've gone back and done the whole screen green. So bikes have a very sizable lane, actually um, half of the, half of the, half, well not half of the space, but a quarter of the space. Public transit, we have light rail intersecting, no public transit on this street per se, but intersecting, so I, th I say that's checked off. Commercial vehicles, we have parking and loading zones along the streets, so that's, that's good. High occupancy vehicles, I'm going to throw that in with transit. And then finally, single occupancy vehicles, we still have one lane for single occupancy vehicles, and we also have parking. So this is one intersection that was taken care of, we already had the hierarchy set up, and now I have a thousand more to go. <laughs> so this one's a good one, but we have a lot that are still of the 1960s, 1970s mentality, where we, we probably don't have bike lanes, we may or may not have sidewalks. Got a lot of work to do in that regard. So, was it a difficult conversation to have uh, bicycles be hired than public transit? I can think of some equity issues on that. One. It's a it's a good question. Um, the uh, uh, San Francisco um, has a transit first policy. So, after pedestrians, because pedestrians are transit customers, so it's pedestrians, transit bikes. Um, I wasn't involved in those conversations. That was before I started the city. I don't know how those went. Uh, but when you talk to TriMet, um, you know, our tram bus, bus provider, they, they seem to be pretty good with it. I think they think about safety first. And so one of the things that they've uh, been mindful of is that the, the you know, bikes need to, need, um, need to be, have treatments that, that address their safety. And I think for some of the smaller trips, um, bikes, if, if, you know, if you can avoid the transit trip, um, that's not a bad thing for, for the bus. Uh, and, and, and rail operations. Yeah. How does how does funding match up with the hierarchy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 At the city, actually, the, the funding is actually very strong for bike ped mode split, um, and we've kind of been looking at it in terms of mode split. Mm -hmm. um, now, one could argue that we should be looking at it in terms of our 2030 mode split. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's an argument to be had there, but. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, obviously it's good discussions at the bu budget advisory committee around that topic. So you answered that question earlier this morning in that, that certain quarters are transit focused, so those quarters would have transit as a higher priority, or certain right. quarters would mm -hmm. be freight focused, so that would have a higher mm -hmm. priority in, the, in that realm. But uh, overall, is what you're saying citywide, that's the paradigm. That's right. So if you have this, you have to also layer it on top of the plan. So there are some streets where this, you know, this is, a, if, it's a, if it's the highest order of transit street, um, then, then transit is going to get a, um, preferential treatment. We want to we we um, we accommodate pedestrians. We may not encourage pedestrians as high on those transit streets um, because we may be trying to move trains. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes? Do you have a sense, so one question is budget, another question is space. Do you have a sense of how the different modes account for space in the current layout? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about uh, percentage of space devoted to all uh, just transportation in general. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I don't know that. I gotta imagine that bikes are probably one of the lowest, mm -hmm. um, lowest percentage. But good question. Wish I had the answer. Okay. So policies is, I'm going to put the policies to the side for a second, we come back to that, I want to give you a little bit of background on traffic engineering, okay? 
and, and where we come from as, as a profession. Because I think that's telling to what, who you're dealing with, what you're dealing with, um, to give you a sense for, we're not really bad people. <laughs> just misunderstood. <laughs> so traffic engineering is part of the civil engineering discipline. Okay, so my first, I was not, my goal in life was not traffic engineering. My goal in life was the, to build something like the Golden Gate Bridge. Right? Oh, wow. build, a, build a massive structure, fantastic, right? You could say, you know that bolt right there? I, I did the calculations. I know exactly how big that bolt would be. Okay? But then I started talking to the structural engineers that were doing that. They didn't seem to like their jobs too much. <laughs> how did you all do this? Figure out how the bolt will work? That seems kind of boring. <laughs> so, and then I also, the other thing would be, in fact, it was, um, I needed a job. I needed a job. Right? Even back then, it wasn't easy to find jobs. So, traffic was my first job. So, structural engineering, hydraulics, you know, designing water and sewer systems, soil foundations, all that stuff underneath your buildings. One of the defining features of all those things is we never, ever, ever want those to fail. Right? Failure, failure is not an option. Right? Houston, we have a problem. Okay, that's our overarching philosophy, and I, so I use the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It's not a slight on you guys. Yeah. <laughs> just a fantastic hey. example of that. We don't think so. Yeah. But we don't, you know, we don't want those, we don't want that to happen. <coughs> so from an engineering standpoint, that's that's who you're talking to, is, is, is folks that have been drilled into them for five years of engineering calculations of how not to fail. Okay? How not to fail. So do we like Fs on our report cards? No. No. Okay? We don't like to fail. We design failure out of the question. So, <laughs> time for a quiz. <laughs> for a quiz. Okay, I teach a class at adjunct faculty. I'm adjunct faculty at Portland State. Um, so I, I love to get quizzes. It's always good to know again who's paying attention. So, yeah, you'll take traffic level service 101. <laughs> <laughs> All right, traffic level service 101. How cast a manual defines failure as the breakdown of flow. Mm -hmm. This is the threshold where you reach failure at signalized intersections. <laughs> <laughs> what, is that, what is that threshold? What is that threshold? Multiple light cycles. Multiple light cycles. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. That's a good one. But what is that value? What's that, what, do you, what would you expect that number to be? 80 seconds. 80 seconds. Anybody want to? Whoa. It's 80 seconds. It's eight, it is. It's 80 seconds. Oops. It's delays of 80 seconds per vehicle. We have a ringer in the room. It's the closet engineer. Let's get him. Delays of 80 seconds per vehicle. All right. So that's what that's what failure is. That's a highway passing mail 2010. That's uh, that's what tells us what failure is. Okay. 80 seconds per vehicle. Any problem with that definition? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> What's the problem with that definition? It doesn't deal with people. It doesn't deal with people, it's right. Yeah. Okay, per vehicle. If you're a pedestrian, we don't care about you. Right. Exactly. You're not a vehicle. <laughs> it's like people are corporations. Yeah. Right. Our methodology does not consider pedestrians as a part of it. Okay? We just don't. That's just how the manual is put together doesn't have pedestrians as a part of that delay methodology. So if I eliminate a crosswalk, make you cross three legs of the crosswalk, no the delay doesn't go up. It's no big deal. It's not in the, not in the manual, not in the methodology. Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if you delay a, a Hummer with one guy in it, 80 seconds, it counts the same as if you delay a bus with that's right. Gosh, have you seen this presentation before? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> so the problem statement, the problem statement I'll pose to you, okay? And I'll just pose it to, and I'll pose it to anyone. Today's methodology doesn't consider person delay. Okay? That's very easy. I can do that tomorrow. And actually, we're looking at this as a city trying to come up with our new level of service or performance measures who may leave level of service behind. But we should be considering at least personally. I can get data from the transit agency to tell me how many people are on the bus. Shouldn't I wait the 
directions based on number of people on the bus? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So pedestrian crossings, <laughs> bikes, largely forgotten these traditional measures. Okay, so check number one. We should change that tomorrow. This, we should be looking at person delay instead of vehicle delay. Okay, it's just I'm just that's just what the existing manual provides. And our standards. So vehicles are people. Our standards do not accept. Um, sorry, I screwed that up. Greater than 80 seconds of delay per vehicle. No procedure to consider less than 80 seconds. So apologize, I need to swap, swap those. This is when I check to make sure you're stay, still staying away. <laughs> and those, so this is, you may have seen this. Um, this is the example of 60 cars, 60 people in a bus, and 60 people, um, 60 people walking. Just the size of space you need. So if you think about it from a city standpoint, obviously the 60 cars, <coughs> Take up a lot more space, require a lot more, a lot more uh, work to figure out how you fit those 60 cars in a particular spot. Okay. So that's number one: vehicles or people. I think most people choose people. All right, quiz number two. Quiz number two: congestion. What is congestion? Okay, is this congestion? Okay, this is in Delft. This is a. Uh, this is, I take a class from Portland State. I've taken them for two weeks um, to Delft to go see what's happening in the Netherlands with engineering. Uh, it's actually the first year I'm not going to go for in three years, so I'm going to miss this trip. But uh, this, is, this is what congestion is in the Netherlands. Right? Get back to the train station, you got to go find your bike. This is tough. This is a problem. They are working. They're spending a lot of money to solve this. And I'll give you an example of how they're spending money to solve that. But if you don't know where your bike is, you're kind of stuck. It's a lot of bikes. But what is congestion? Multiple choice on this one. Multiple choice. You ready? So congestion is A, it's bad. <laughs> it must be mitigated. We must fix this problem. I mean, that's kind of the Houston model. Houston, Texas, bad. B, it's inevitable and a result of poor planning by the travel demand model. Darn planners. Ah. Underestimating demand. C, something we should build our way out of. The Houston model as well. Yeah. And, and D, a tool that can be used to make active transportation more competitive. Or E, D, and the opposite of A, B, and C. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's E or I, I think it's D. I think it's just D. I don't know if it's necessarily. It can be bad. It can be bad. Okay. Right? If you're trying to get a fire truck through. Or a fire bike, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the fire department's you know, responding to a fire, trying to get to that one bike. And, uh, <laughs> the congestion, congestion is bad. It's bad in some cases, right? If you're trying to get a fire truck there. Um, but it's definitely not C, right? It's not something we can build our way out of. We can't build enough highways. Houston's tried that for years and years and years. Still have a lot of congestion. Mm -hmm. okay. D is definitely true. But we don't think about competition of modes. We're going to spend over... $1.5 billion in the light rail project in Portland. Um, and the Federal Transit Administration made us widen streets for cars to make sure that we mitigate all the traffic associated with the transit project. Yeah, it's a federal requirement. Right. Right? Using the high capacity manual level service methodology. I'll just let you think about that. Did, yeah, question. Did, did they demand that you um, um, make uh, active transportation access? Did they demand that you spend money on that too? No. Oh, too many gateway events. Just out of curiosity. Not really. In fact, I was uh, working on a project in the community on bus rapid transit about five years ago. And uh, we were doing a you know, major investment of bus rapid transit, looking at trying to find right away for the bus to. to, to and the state DOT, that will remain nameless, said, well, you know, what's your forecast for traffic? And so we gave them some ideas of how we would you know, reduce traffic associated with the bus because people would be you know, getting on the bus. They said, nope, we've got to be most conservative, so I want you to assume the exact same traffic with BRT than without. Hi. It's like, well, why are we doing this project then? Yeah, right. What's the point? Nobody shifts. So, anyway, a little policy thing. So, uh, just start with a, a, just, just a little segue to a quote, um, Jane Jacobs, um, uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities, uh, great book if you haven't read it. Uh, this is uh, one of the books I read when I was in Texas when I started to go, what is wrong with this place? 
And one of the things that she wrote about was the more space provided cars and cities, the greater becomes the need for use of cars, and hence for still more space for them. And that was a quote from the city of Fort Worth, Texas, mm -hmm. traffic engineer, mm -hmm. who was trying to figure out how to make the downtown as accessible as possible by car, and realize the problem. So, quick commentary on the focus of the highway capacity mail. It's a uh, uh, highway projects over the past 60 years serve us well as a profession if we're really focused on designing highways, right? If you're going to try to make sure everybody gets from their car, from their subdivision to their uh, their job in the morning without any congestion, we can design that. Uh, but what happens when the communities to the next city and next community over fill? Does it results in sprawl? And I'm sure you guys know a little bit about that here. We know about it in Portland as well, but we've tried to contain it to some degree with our urban growth boundary. So, one of the things about the highway capacity mail that I love to share is pedestrians and models and pediments to traffic flow. Okay? Put in pedestrians to the model and shows that the impacts flow. Again, it doesn't factor into the delay. So that's one of the aspects. So common practice, eliminate crosswalks. <coughs> no, no effect to the delay. Um, in fact, it, it can show that it can make it better if you, if you can have more flexibility in the signal time. So you don't have to give all that green time to those pedestrians crossing the street. So evolution of the high capacity mail. Was it, why is it this way? Have you guys seen Roger Rabbit? <laughs> That was the other book that I started reading. Uh, it was James Howard Kunstler, and he talked about you know, the anti-streetcar conspiracy. Was it an, is it an anti-streetcar conspiracy? No, I don't think so. Uh, but it just results, it represents the suburban experience. It's uh, the, who writes the high capacity manual is actually, well, the old firm that I used to work with, uh, work for, and, and it essentially it's just engineers and academics doing research. They do research to try to make their lives better, their experience, maybe in a suburban setting. And if 95% of the population drives, you know, why, why, is, why is that a problem? Um, so I think as we think about realizing that we've tried this experiment, we've, we've worked hard on um, trying to make sure that everybody could drive everywhere, realizing that it doesn't always work out as well as we'd like, um, we're, we're, turning the, we're turning a little bit. So the evolution of the high capacity mail, I'll just say it's happening. Um, the new mail, the 2010 edition, has multi-modal level service. Um, the bike research, just to give you a little sense, the bike research that's included in the mail was done in what state? What do you think is the hotbed of bike <laughs> research? <laughs> Florida. 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 It's black. Two communities. Two communities. Two communities in Florida, Tallahassee and Tampa. Oh. Tampa was the, one of the worst, <clears throat> from a safety standpoint, worst community that I ever worked in as a consultant. A lot of 45 mile an hour streets because it's flat and straight. Oh, in fact, a lot of 45 and 55 mile an hour streets. Mm. In fact, I just went back to Texas and I was amazed at how many 75 mile an hour <gasps> four lane arterials there were. Oh. Oh. Arterials? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How did that happen? I mean, like, if, if it's no, not be safe, then all that stuff be exercised. What do you mean it's not safe? It's perfectly safe. Nobody walks there. <laughs> <laughs> And if somebody, if somebody walks, we can put up a wall. We can engineer that out of the way. No problem. It's something that I think it, uh, it, it's just dependent on your outcome. Right? What is your outcome? So, great question. Let's we'll talk about that a little bit. The speed, it, the speed is really an issue. Uh, what do the Dutch do? So, I talked about the, my experience in the, in the Netherlands. I like to say that the Dutch usually have it all figured out. They're just way ahead of us. Okay. So land use is tightly controlled, not something we necessarily do here, although uh, maybe, maybe you're doing more of that. Uh, they really think about design over demand. When they lay out a new community, and, and we, we would tour these various communities, um, even you know, not, we wouldn't tour Amsterdam, that's not where you learn, it's where you learn is when they're laying out streets from scratch to figure out how they're putting them together. As they, they prioritize, they just say, we're gonna put bikes first, we're gonna make bikes the most competitive mode, so it's, Really silly to choose any other trip for, or any other mode for a for a very short trip. Um, transit is very competitive, obviously the rail system, and then driving is not subsidized. They have a lot of money to do the right thing, which we don't always have that choice as public sector folks. We're scraping together enough money to do the project that uh, 
that we, we, we hope will uh, be the right thing for your neighborhood. So there's always some, there's always some trade-offs that we try to make there. So is it the engineer's fault? Well, let's go back to that poor engineer just trying to make a good decision. The answer is no. Uh, part of it is the planning realm. We have tra travel demand models that think about 2030, in fact, Portland's model. Uh, one of the things I love to ask the planners is, what's the cost of gas in 2030? Mm -hmm. And they don't really have an answer explicitly of what that cost of gas is. They've modeled a lot of behavior. They've used straight line estimates of growth or traffic in some cases. Very complicated model travel behavior. Um, the other question that's kind of gotten some buzz in the last couple of years is do young people still want to drive? Are they valuing the car as much as our, um, our, our, uh, our, our uh, community, our community, or our commuters today? So that's a, there's some open questions there. Um, one of the things the model, and this is a transit problem as well, is we think about um, one 10 mile trip is the same as 10 one mile trips. We don't value the short trips, so we we under um, we under encourage those those trips. Okay, so shifting gears. So it's not only the engineer's fault, but we have some reason for blame. We put up signs like this that say stupid things like "obey your signal," two stage crossing. And if I'm a pedestrian, and when I'm a pedestrian, I say, "Well, wait a minute. If I was in my car, you wouldn't tell me to obey a two stage crossing. What are you doing to me?" And and but that's one of those things. We have to when you see certain these sorts of things. Should call them out and figure out how we might change that. Yeah. Well, you know, pedestrians frequently have to go. You know, cars can turn, and pedestrians can't. They have to go one street at a time. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, a. Yeah. It's inequity. It's it's unfair. <laughs> it's unfair. Something must be done. Okay. So there's problems with our analysis in terms of our traffic analyses. We've talked about those. We fail to consider the completeness of the system. We have vehicle vehicle centric performance measures. We look at peak 15 minute flows. Sometimes we design for just a peak 15 minute flow. It's like designing the parking lot for Black Friday. <laughs> um, there's limited tools for engineers to make improvements, and that's um, one of the things that uh, is emerging is some of the work that New York City <coughs> DOT is doing. Where they're looking at different performance measures. So as an engineer, I can start to think about it differently and look at, well, actually, there's, there are other measures, and, and here's just an example of safety, access, and places. And the measures are, well, measure do something, engineer, you do something, and then measure if you reduce crashes. Don't tell me about delay, just measure if you reduce crashes. Tell me if you reduce the speeding. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you increase the vitality of my community. And tell me if people like it. And that's one of the things they're doing is when they put in new plazas and things, simplified intersections, they ask people, well, do you like it? Not measuring delay for the people that are driving from New York to Newark or Newark to Long Island, they're asking, do you like it? They're asking the people that are there. They're asking the residents. They're asking the people that pay the taxes locally. So that's something that's a little different than what we've been able to do. Okay, I'll turn gears a little bit and talk about things that we've done in Portland um, and how we've, uh, how we've gotten around all these roadblocks. So the Hawthorne Bridge is my favorite example. This is my bike commute home. So I come up in the bike lane and I'm making a uh, veering right to get on the path that's on the bridge to the right of the cars. And you see this stream of cars here, right here. Okay, that didn't used to be stopped. Okay, that didn't used to be stopped. So as a bike, you're having to look for a gap and try to yield to that movement. So what we did is we stopped that traffic. And we backed traffic up during the PM peak hour. We back it up about four blocks. Just five. <laughs> maybe maybe six on a good day. Oh no! We back, we do. We back up traffic. But this is the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Okay. This was one cycle in downtown Portland. This is another facility. But this is 16 bikes in one cycle. That's fantastic. That's like the Netherlands. Right. right? So we are. We are meeting our objective by making sure that we have direct routes that are safe. Oh, how did you handle all the complaints about that software? Great yeah. question. Yeah. And what outreach did you do? Yeah. Oh, I took that out of the presentation. Let me, uh, I'll just And how back. long has that been going on? <laughs> uh, it's been going on, gosh, probably eight to ten years. Wow. 
So if you only look, I didn't think you guys would ask that technical question. <laughs> so if you only look at this intersection, this one intersection, or this intersection with the Google view. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, I'm in Seattle, I should use the ding. You look at the big maps view, no? He no. doesn't have bicycles. <laughs> okay, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't should pander to the audience. <laughs> so if you only look at this intersection, yes, you would say the delay is pretty substantial. But if you look at it as a system, if I'm in my car and I'm driving up NATO Parkway to try to get onto that ramp, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Oh, okay. Before you get there, you should make a left turn. Go one block into the downtown, go the first northbound route, go right, and then come straight down so you avoid that conflict. The delay will be much better. It's a system. Don't provide for auto traffic. They can take a one block or two block trip out of direction. So do they? No, they don't. That's my problem. That's my problem. Put it on a sign so they can read it. If only Google Maps would tell them. That's why we put it on. I let them suffer. You know, I'm not going to. Ten years, you think you can learn? Some of them. They have the radio. They're comfortable. with So, Peter, you do answer Sam's question about complaints. And right. right. Yeah. Oh, I refer to them as the bike coordinator. Just <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm the signals guy. I don't see a signal. I don't see a signal there. I don't worry about those things. Uh, in reality, I don't, I don't know. I, I was before I got there. So. <laughs> uh, but we did actually, we looked at this as a part of the uh, the new light rail project because they were concerned about backing up traffic. And I said, well, you know, if we put a signal in there, if we put a signal in that junction, it's actually showing that it's going to increase traffic and reduce, you know, increase delay for bikes. So we said, yeah, we could go a different <laughs> But that's the thing, that sort of thing. You have to look at it as a system. You can't just look at it as a one intersection. That's often what we do is we don't look, we don't think about it as creatively as we should. And of course, so this is, uh, this is from our local newspaper looking at the traffic over the over the bridges. We had a little blip in 2009, but had great success increasing travel across bridges, which is a good indicator. Okay, so that's one of those measures. Yes? So how's, how's the total number of people crossing that bridge? Great question. Great question. So our greatest increase in people is biking. Okay. So cars have been pretty much constant. Cars are not growing over the bridges. It's already full. Okay, it's already full. You just must we build another bridge. Say again. Did they decrease when you made it easier to buy them? No. Nope. No. Nope. Those they lanes fill up pretty good. Yeah. You guys have new strategies for um, making bridges better. The, so that, that bridge, the Bolton Bridge, the bike stretch is already on the sidewalk. We had an enormous sidewalk that I believe was added to that bridge at some point. We did widen that sidewalk. Yeah. Um, what about like the Burnside Bridge? Because like that's currently a bike lane on a ginormous road. Mm -hmm. Like, do you guys have strategies for making bridges where you don't have that? Like, do you guys have anything planned? Are you thinking about things for the Burnside Bridge? Because like that's not a really pleasant bridge to bike over. Yes, we have. We're, 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 much we're thinking about it. Um, we have a little bit of a jurisdictional issue. County owns all the bridges. Uh, oh, okay. uh, sorry. Uh, I don't mean to punt that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, case study two. Let's talk about things I can't control. Um, so this is uh, Broadway Williams, one of our most dangerous intersections in the city, uh, circa 2008-2009. Anybody want to wager a guess why it's the most one of the most dangerous intersections? We have a blue painted bike lane. Shouldn't that address all the concerns? <laughs> like, all you need is paint, right? There's a bike lane even. There's a bike lane even there. Okay. Look at the signs up above. So we have a turn, a, a, a sharp right, and then a kind of a sloping right. Look at the lane sign next to it. That's and that's not for the bikes. That's the travel lane to the left of the bike. So a right turn could turn across the bike lane. Oh, oh my story. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a problem? Sandwich in between cars. But it's the national standard. This is from the Ashdo bike guide. It says actually we shouldn't even carry the lane through. Just drop the bike lane. 
That's the national standard. You should, you should never have, the, the, the rule is you should never have a bike lane to the right of a right turn lane. That's the rule. So you just stop the lane. So you, yeah. Yeah, as a cyclist, I actually agree with that. I would, I, I would much rather be behind a car, in front of a car, you know, behind one car and in front of another car where they can see you, than to their right. Okay, hold that, hold that thought. Let me give you the solution. Let me see if you like it. Okay, so here's the model in our traffic model. Okay, our little traffic model doesn't show a bike lane. We don't model bikes in our traffic analysis tools. So keep that in mind. So we kind of fixed one in to look at how that might work, okay? Um, and our, as we look through it, one of the scenarios that we said was bike lane, keep it curb tight until you get to this intersection, and then control that bike lane separate from the right turn. <coughs> kind of a European, you know, this is what they do all the time in Europe. We look through the analysis, do the call it volume capacity ratio because the state doesn't like us to use delay, they like to use volume capacity ratio, and show that the volume capacity ratio with a westbound bike phase would still be underneath their threshold. So they let us do it, do you believe that? <laughs> so this is the example. So now we have two right turn lanes, we got rid of that blue right, we keep the bike lane curb tight, and we control that separately from the right turning traffic. What was right on right producing that? Uh, let's see, was right turn on right? I, I don't, actually, I think it might have been. I don't think it was, no, there was no turn on right. No turn on right. Sorry. That was a few years ago now. So this picture shows, it's my favorite picture, because I snapped it right before, right as the bike signal went red. Okay, the next second, that green, those green arrows would be going green. And this bike is just clearing the far side of the intersection. And this is the first week it was turned on. We weren't sure how it was gonna work. We, was knowing the, we knew the manual had said not to do this. And we looked at European practices and it seemed like this might work. Yeah? Is there a best turn possible as well? And is it, what's it time the bike turn, the bike travel? There isn't a pedestrian crossing there. Okay. Um, it's, it's kind of a substandard sidewalk, and there isn't a lot to walk there. This is a gas station. It's not a. So we actually asked them to cross over. <laughs> <laughs> if there were um, 10 bicycles in here queued up, would the light stay green for bicycles on it? Uh, it's, it's, is, it is demand actuated. Um, we, uh, uh, would 10 get through? Probably not. Not many people were using this. Really, it was just kind of the strong and fearless that were using this. <laughs> now, with this, we see a, we see an uptick of, of, of normal everyday <laughs> cycles as opposed to the spandex um, speed demons that are out there using this, or the, um, the you know, mid-20s young and fearless. Does the bike have to push a button, or it, it goes and recycles? Great question. Um, the state... <laughs> In their infinite wisdom, required us to push a button here. Oh. Oh. That was the requirement. No, no, no. That was the requirement. We said, eh, let's, let's experiment. Let's put in detectors in the pavement. Yeah. And so that's what would, and actually, nobody hits the button anymore because they know the detectors in the pavement work for them. So if you're getting a lot more people using it now, are you, ever going to, are you going to have to look at changing the length of the bike greenlight? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a variable between 8 and 12 seconds. And um, it seems to be working quite well. Um, it's a 70 second cycling, so it comes up very often. So if you do get stopped here, your delay is pretty low. It's less than a minute. So it doesn't fail. So I'm, I'm in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so this is the configuration that we change. Uh, pretty different characteristics. Lots of different facets. And again, this was one where we designed it originally, and some of this. When we got out there, we said, we could make it better. And so we added a bunch of this stuff, the part-time PTR, I love acronyms, TLAs, three-letter acronyms. Part-time restriction signs. So that sign comes on right before the bike goes green. There's already no turn on red sign. We just want to emphasize that. We don't want that right turn traffic to 
to. So is that blink or something, or how? Did, it just it comes on and it's active and it's it's red and it's bright when you can okay. see it as it comes mm -hmm. through. Yeah. So some of this stuff we truly are making up, but it's been effective since we turned it on in 2010. We haven't had a single crash. Wow. <laughs> so we feel pretty good about that. And it's off our list of worst, worst in terms of the city. Okay, so we're separating those time, those movements. Okay, case day three, greenways. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Is that no turn on red thing eliminated at all times? No. You can't turn right? No. We have a static sign. We have a static sign that's no turn on red right here. Okay. But we want to emphasize it when the bike is green. It's like green, it's, it was, I don't know why I never got the bike signal green, but that's the bike's yellow there. And the no turn on red sign extinguishes when it goes red to let the cars know that they're coming up next. Huh. All right, case study three. This is my last last case study. I'll keep you all night here. Is greenways. Okay. When you have this many cyclists on the greenway, this is my greenway next to my house then you know you're doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what you should demand from your greenways is that traffic signals pay attention. <laughs> I like to say, fix the signals or you have to deal with this bunch. <laughs> and that's my nine-year-old on the, on the left with their soccer coach. So you know that you have to deal with a really tough, <laughs> tough group. Okay, so in summary, ask the engineer to follow the policy. Oftentimes, the policy is set up for your success. You just gotta ask them to follow. Advocate design for safety. It's safety we don't always focus on. But safety is number one. Measure the outcomes. Okay, we talked about some measures and how we're gonna change some of the measures in the future. One of the measures is to ask people if they think it's working. And then finally to provide feedback. Um, tell people when you think it's not working for, for you. Okay? Be selfish out there. With that, I'll thank you and ask you for any questions that you may have. Yeah. When you introduce, when you make something new up, right, how do you educate drivers and cyclists about how it works? What kind of public education, like when you introduced green bike boxes? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, we, green, box, green bike boxes was a big effort. We, uh, we decided to do um, um, billboards throughout the city. We advertised on um, on buses. Um, they did uh, signs at each bike box to let them know it was coming. Um, and uh, I think we had some public service announcements again. That was before I got to the city. But they had a great um, a great kind of blitz of uh, of different media. And I did a video, kind of a fun video, um, with it as well. So it. Um, it's kind of on, on several fronts. They try to get the message. Prioritized out. it then. Yeah, really. absolutely. And your department has a big encouragement uh, department, sub department too. The bureau does. Uh, we do a lot with active transportation. Um, Maybe you can talk just a little about that because we don't have one. Oh, uh, yeah, tell us about yeah. that. You don't have one at all. Where is it? Wow, we have a. Uh, gosh. Uh, we have a. Uh, I think the active transportation group is uh, 25 people. And those are employees, like paid people? Paid employees. And they do encouragement, not engineering? They do all sorts of things. They do engineering. There are some engineers there. So they're engineering some of these solutions. Um, not necessarily the signals. The signals come my way if my engineers work on that. So actually, the active transportation group has, I think, 25. Um, and if you consider, I like. I was always saying, with the budget as it was, signals and street line was not getting any bigger. So I used to like to say, signals are active transportation. <laughs> so that active transportation money coming my way. <laughs> we want to be part of the solution. So we were doing things that was active transportation as well. So it was a big emphasis for us uh, throughout the city. Uh, not just the engineering and design, but also the, uh, the encouragement. So we do things like uh, breakfast appreciation. We do bike to work, lots of activities. Right. Um, in terms of just letting people know that we want you to be on your bike and you think it's, it's great. Of course, Neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood greenways is, is partially used in um, the Sunday Parkways, so that's a that's a big effort. It takes a lot of time and energy for staff. Yeah. So, you know, back to your original goal of 25 percent people riding their bikes. Is is the plan to just incrementally do these things, or is there some sort of 
big moment like congestion traffic pricing or some taxation thing? I mean, or do you think these laudable things will be enough to get you to 25%? We're going to start twisting people's arms. <laughs> uh, now, um, whew, that's a great question. Great question. Um, you know, I think the, we're not doing a lot of big picture things. Condition pricing is not something that's really happening, although we're maybe getting our first toll with a big bridge across the Columbia River. Um, the tolling is something that maybe could help uh, to some degree, but I don't know how much it's going to affect things locally. I mean, people, I don't think we're at the stage where we're ready to ask people to commute by bike by, you know, for 15 or 20 miles, although it does happen, but it's not high likelihood, it's a small percentage. Um, so we're doing things at the local level, the 20 minute neighborhood concept of getting people to bike for just their normal errands. Uh, I think it's Malmo, Sweden has a great encouragement program, like no ridiculous trips or no, no, no silly trips. Yeah, it's like trips less than a mile. It's like, come on, really? You're going to get in your car to go a mile? So we got some work to they do. Get, they give awards to the people who can come up with the silliest trip. <laughs> Self ridicule and shaming. Yeah. Do you know much about enforcement? I mean, it doesn't seem the engineer's realm exactly, but for example, here we have things parked in the bike lanes all the time. I went around Lake Union today, and there were four different times wow. that the bike path was you know, you impeded be, by... You what I'm saying? We're doing a good job. I usually see an example we're not doing a good job. And that's probably the staff and the development staff of making sure that <coughs> contractors know, we, you know we're serious about bike lanes and we want you to think about it and that our traffic control plans when we're doing work are, are thinking about that. So we get it right some of the time. It's, it's, it boils down to good staff and Complaints. We're very, we're very complaint driven at city. We're very reactive. But is there any of your design stuff that is around? I mean, I guess how much do you deal with the, that? I mean, I guess we are moving the places where people normally would deliver things. I, I don't know. I mean, I, absolutely. It's uh, and so you must have some. I'm hoping to have some tricks. Like, is there anything? No, it, it just gets down to good decisions, right? And telling people what we expect. And saying, telling the contractor, no, you can't park there. And, and you have to accommodate bikes during this construction. In fact, the, from the top, the top of USDOT, Ray LaHood, I had a, pres had a part of my presentation this morning, he talks about, he says, even during maintenance projects, you've got to be thinking about biking. I mean, so from the top of USDOT, he's telling people, get this done, make sure you do it. The problem is, you know, that's a, it's a long ways between me and Ray Lilith. So, and, you know, and, and I, you know, we, we are just, we are very reactive. We are, we are, I do not, I do not send people out to the site, the job site, when we're doing construction to make sure that happens. It's, uh, it's based on inspections and, you know, whenever my staff can get out there, when, when uh, the contractors are out there, we're not standing on our shovels just waiting for stuff <laughs> to happen, right? So it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough one to solve. Well, so what she's talking about, though, it sounds to me, are short-term deliveries. So sometimes, maybe not. I, I often yeah. see like a UPS truck or that kind of thing. By the time you complain, they're gone. Yeah. Well, well today, today one truck. of them was a huge moving truck, and uh, they were going to sit there for hours. Yeah, and our parking enforcement can't right do right things about that, so that's something that if they're in the wrong spot, you know, you gotta call the city and complain. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question, and um, this starts to sound, sound like a rant rather than a question. Please stop me. I love the fact that you showed the idea of incrementally reducing speed of cars to make it safe for cyclists. I did most of my biking in Holland, and what surprised me in America is I don't get that pedestrian signal phase protected like I took for granted in the Netherlands. Is there, like, I mean, it feels like if you ask about the idea of, like, can I ever as a pedestrian get a walking phase that isn't the high speed right turn phase? Like, is that ever, like, can you explain, like, as an engineer, why is that not something that's even on, like, the ground of credibility to talk about in North America? We, we do that, uh, it's complaint driven. So we do leading pedestrian intervals, what we call them. Mm -hmm. You gotta ask for the right answer. You, know, you gotta write, ask, you gotta use the acronym. I need an LPI here, come on. <laughs> yeah, LPI. Leading pedestrian So we do leading pedestrian intervals, and that's just something that, uh, We'll do based on complaints. We don't usually do it on the first complaint, but if you organize a bunch of community <laughs> members, we do it based on crowdsourcing of complaints. Okay. We have one and there are obviously trade-offs of doing that. Um, we don't like to do them when, um, when there's a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of congestion, of course, but if push comes to shove, we want safety to be important. So we're we can be responsive to those complaints. Yeah. It seems like mixing the pedestrian crossing and the right turning signal at the same time causes congestion. At least in some of the busy streets that I see, because there are pedestrians going, and they're not all in lockstep crossing together. There's stragglers and people coming yeah. in. That causes people turning right to wait because they usually, <laughs> and and then all the people who want to go straight through are stuck waiting behind the, the people trying to turn right. So if anything, it seems like it's causing congestion. Yeah. Sure, I mean it's a, it's a it's a trade off, right? I mean I think that's something that we've uh, we've we've struggled with in downtown Portland. One of the things that we've done, I think, a really good job with is setting up signals so that the speeds are progressed at lower mm -hmm. speeds is something I've really been trying to emphasize as a part of my staff mm -hmm. um, is when you go out there we want to relook at what we're doing. In downtown Portland our progression speeds for traffic are 16 miles an hour. Wow. Um, when I was working at consultant, you know, downtown Baltimore's writing IT or, or journal articles about how well we got 35 mile an hour through the downtown. <laughs> um, it's a trade-off, right? That's a choice. There's no Guidebook that tells you what the speed is. It's just it's just a it's just a choice in terms of what your objectives are and what you're trying to prioritize. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, when you're talking about the CRC, I think technically the correct term for it is a freeway expansion. I didn't talk about the CRC. <laughs> <laughs> but the the real question I want to ask is, uh, you know, it seems like with everybody having smartphones and cameras, and when you're looking at a dangerous intersection. I mean, the, currently the problem is you don't see things until somebody dies, for the most part. Right? Nothing gets reported until there's somebody being hauled off in an ambulance tour. We're doing a little better job with that, but go on, go on. Yeah, so, I mean, are you guys looking at you know, partnering with, with uh, universities or app developers or something to try to get some early surveillance into what the heck's going on with your intersections before you, they rise the level of killing somebody? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a crash reporting. Um, the problem is trying to get that filled out, um, and, and so you know that's something that uh, we try to get the message out there. But it's, uh, uh, it's I mean, it's a limitation. My uh, my dad was a bike commuter, and um, he was always very deferential. He was in three crashes, and he didn't report a single one of them. Right. He just said, "Well, it's probably maybe it's my fault." Da da da. You know, I didn't yeah. mean to. to uh, it was just one of those like uh, you know, it yeah. just wasn't a wasn't just wasn't a big thing for him, um, which is like. Dad, your bike's broken. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it's one of those. It's just it's just one of those aspects that uh, hopefully we're evolving to. That we do, um, if we're smarter about it. We do have um, apps that we can develop, and, and but that's something that's we're not we're not actually doing that. We're just still in the paper realm. Well, another thing that you might want to look at is partnering with the university, get some of the computer vision people. So you know, the red light cameras. That's obviously a big legal step. But just sending a camera up and doing some image recognition stuff. Just to, to parse out what's happening. We are doing that. Um, okay. We have a, 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 I mean, have a we've done it with uh, inductive loop detectors for cars. We actually are just experimenting with a thermal um, image mm -hmm. camera that's trying to discern bikes versus vehicles. So that's that's something that's uh, that's 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 What do you do with uh, intersections? You know, you mentioned like people complaining. Uh, if you have an intersection that's on a street that basically no one cares about, so for example, uh, we have a street over the Elliott Avenue West that. Um, Basically, SDOT has signalized it like a freeway in the PM peak from about 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. There's this huge light cycle that goes for like two minutes, cars outbound from downtown. And it's actually quite a big problem because like it's, it's very hard to cross there. It's a huge, you know, it's, it's a big wide road and they make you wait for like two minutes. And it actually impacts transit quite badly because you, uh, there's a left turning bus that has to cross this traffic. How do we like? Well, what, what do I say to like, just, I actually complained about this and they told me, yeah, good arterial signal progression is why we've done this. How do I go, like, what, am I, what do I tell a signal engineer to not, like, how do I convince them this is a bad idea? I think it's not a neighborhood street that anyone cares about because it's basically this sort of industrial, you know, fairly boring area. There's not like a bunch of people who live there who I can get to them right about this. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, I'll, I'll answer I'll knowledge. Answer that, yeah. so the Bruce at LA Avenue, uh, anyway, that's our uh, north south arterial. So if that breaks down, downtown pretty much breaks down. So it's the reason why we're trying to push traffic through there. I mean, we do care about pedestrians, but we also need to make sure that transit gets through. There's a lot of transit that goes north and south, and obviously there's that rapid right that makes up left. But a lot of competing needs, freight needs. 
So but there are a lot of people who stop and actually work on that corridor. Yeah, yeah. And for those of us who do and who take the bus, it's I have to add like probably almost maybe not ten, but over five minutes to the time I get there to the bus on the other side because it's, it takes so long to cross the street at any of the push button ones and it's very unpredictable. So the amount of cursing that happens when <laughs> <laughs> your bus passes you because you were there in time but you can't get across the street. Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually it's interesting because I got a complaint that on uh, 15th and Holman, yep. yeah. someone was waiting five minutes there repeatedly so you know it was like a multiple complaint. When I went out and reviewed it for the time that they were they were waiting, it was 90 seconds the, the maximum, mm -hmm. and the minimum was like it was about you know majority of the time it was less than a minute for for that for that crosswalk to come up, and so people's perception, like you said, when they're waiting there, it seems like five minutes, but if you actually time it, it's quite a bit less. As a citizen, you know, when, when I'm driving, it's like, ah, why am I waiting here? It's like, you know, yeah. it's just left. And yeah, I mean, that's one of those things that we do coordinate signals, and um, we're working on a little bit of work to, sometimes we just do that, and we arbitrarily set them from 2 to 6 p.m. without any um, performance metrics. So one of the things that we're doing in Portland is uh, when you hit the push button, we've actually set a latch in the timer, in the, in the controller. So we're measuring, actually, how long it's taking you to cross the intersection. When we wait, you know, we, when you hit the button, we start a timer, and when it goes walk, we, we end that timer. And then we get data back to the traffic engineer to say, this is what the delay was. And so then we can look at it and go, yeah, that wasn't five minutes, it was actually 38.7 seconds on average. And, and my, that's, that, meets our, that meets our objective. Or, or no, it's actually three minutes, and that's really bad, and we have people now avoiding the signal because they're crossing the block. So that's something that the perception is usually worse than the reality, um, but that's not to say that um, if there's no traffic there, we can, we should try to do better than we, than we do typically. But um, it's, it's one of those things that it's usually for the engineer that gives a lot of complaints that can be low on, this, on their priority list. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you talked a little bit about uh, the Netherlands being very far ahead of us and also how uh, how you know we in Seattle and Portland have to sometimes make up stuff, and uh, you know in, uh, in 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 the Netherlands uh, after you know they first had their uh, outer freeway expansion and then uh, decided to build a lot of bike infrastructure afterwards and, and, and rebuild cycling like they had to make up a lot of stuff too. They were entering new ground and no, they use like people from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean you know it, it, is it you know. It, it, whenever I've seen documentaries about, about what happened with cycling in the Netherlands, like you know, it was it, it seemed pretty clear that like you know the the reason they became the greatest biking country in the world was because they wanted to, not because they knew how. Uh, and it's 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 do do you think that there's uh, you know in dealing with uh, state and uh, and federal uh, documentation and restrictions that like uh, we're being held too much to what we know how to do and not uh, not to what we want to do? Well, I, I, that's a that's a great question. Um, so the national. Association of City Transportation Officials. It's, kind of a, it's, it's always been around, but it's, it's really got a resurgence with uh, the recent Urban Bikeway Design Guide and, uh, and some other work that's, being, that's happening. And, and that's, a, that's an organization that's really trying to fill the gap that uh, that's, that's, that's follows the federal processes of, of the, the bike guide and the other things that I talked about. So um, I'm, I, I think that's a, that's a real opportunity for leadership in cities and in, in having transportation facilities that respond to the needs of the community and, and uh, so I'm excited about that. I think uh, I think uh, as I work with students at Portland State, there's a lot of bright minds that are progressively um, progressive thinkers about this. So um, I think I think we're on an upward path. I think we'll get there. It's just a matter of um, just a matter of time. Um, just a matter of time and energy and, and, and pushing from people like you. I mean, it's uh, this stuff doesn't get doesn't change overnight. I mean, some, a lot of stuff was built. Uh, I have signals that are fit more than 50 years old. Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them haven't been touched for the last 25. <laughs> and, uh, uh, in fact, our half signals, we just went through an effort to retime all the half signals in Portland um, because they had not been touched in 30 years. Mm -hmm. What's a half signal? Um, it's a signal that has green, yellow, red for the major street, but then just pedestrian crossings for the mm -hmm. major street. Yeah. yeah. 
you mentioned very briefly uh, that the needs of the elderly and mobility impaired are not elderly. Really who are you calling elderly? <laughs> Hey, I'm very proud to be old. I'm old. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, I'm not going to care about me. No, no, I'm talking about myself. Um, and I wonder how that whole segment fits into current thinking about active transportation. And yes. part of the reason that that's so important is, as I'm a retired nurse, and there's a, a serious problem for medical providers as people get older, Absolutely. they have you know they have to tell people you can't drive anymore, and I. Uh, but those medical people don't get engaged in you know well how do I prepare somebody to uh, find other modes of transportation yes. before they are forced to. So. No, it's a very very important element. Um, we talk about um, we talk a little bit about designing from from eight years old to eighty years old. And so designing our transportation system so that you have that opportunity to continue to be active. Um, and, and so that's something that's a, that's a really very important, really uh, really relevant for, for the city as we think about um, you know, there's, there's a growing, growing elderly population in our, in our communities. And um, I don't know that we have all the answers. We're worried about um, elderly staying in their homes and then having to have paratransit that's very expensive to go serve them. Um, so if you think about a potential need to, you know, have people uh, move, that's a, that's a, those are tough choices. Um, those are ch tough choices for people. So, well, I don't, I don't know that I have any of the answers there, but we can do things. We're, and we're reducing the walking speeds at signals so that it's more accommodating for slower users. Um, of course, anytime you can calm the traffic and slow speeds of auto traffic down, that's good from a, from a potential uh, ability to live through a collision if you're if you do crash with a if there's a crash with an auto um, ped crash so lower speeds obviously a higher higher potential for uh, survivability um, but as in the elderly that's 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 actually goes down because there's some frailty if, if you get as you know as people get older 80 so there's a it's a real subject that uh, you know, I don't think we have all the answers but it's something that's on the on the topics. Sure. Um, so the question of going from 8% to 25%, yeah. I mean, so that's an empirical question. I mean, like other cities have done that, so we don't have to ask, can that happen? Because it's like asking, can 20 people fit in this room? Like, of course they can. Anyway. Well, but if you look at this, this is a good picture. So this is that Broadway corridor. Uh -huh. There's not enough room for three times that many cyclists. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? We're going we're gonna to discourage them because we have this construction site. Right, where we're going to have on-street parking. So there's going to be a trade-off that's going to have to be made to get more space. Well, just my question, I guess, is um, can you talk about land use a little bit? Uh, so have just a, if other cities ever been to 25 without strongly addressing land use? I mean, this goes into equity, too. I mean, we're talking about these like downtown areas where rich people live. I mean, there's can you really design your way out of like, like making a shoreline that, that might not ever what? possibly get to 25 without addressing that. Going back to the, the Netherlands, I mean, where do they, in Europe for that matter, where they saw the biggest increase, of course, the gas gas prices went up. Mm -hmm. you know, that can make people respond if the land uses are conducive to people having that as a choice. Um, when you're 30 miles from where you work, that's a really tough choice yeah. to make. So land use is, is huge, um, and as traffic engineers, um, we're not we're not really making the we're not really making that case all the time. Yeah, I was seeing uh, went to Copenhagen uh, with the group last year, and um, their policy is that when you buy a car, you, you pay 180 yeah. percent tax on that car, and so your incentive, you know, if you own that car, is very expensive to start out with. You got to find a place to park, and then the gas is very expensive as well. So uh, having the bike. Very flat. You have very uh, easy access. It's the fastest way to get around. If you have those kind of, uh, you know, the most convenient, the least expensive, and the uh, safest way to get around, you're going to get that mode share. I don't think it's very difficult um, in in kind of the U.S. cities to get get to that level, especially in Seattle with the, the terrain. But uh, you know, with with intelligent design, I'm sure that uh, we can get into the teens and even higher. But you still need to have that public policy. Uh, uh, where uh, you, your mode choice should be 
set so that it encourages that other mode. Yeah. The, uh, in your professional experience, uh, have you noticed the difference between like the West Coast cities like Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, and sort of more East Coast cities like Chicago and New York City came very late to the like get people on bikes game, and they have totally outdone every West Coast city just because they have stronger mayors, like like more sort of localism basically, and they just go along in the street and say, right, we're going to build a bike lane here, and we're just going to take this lane, and you know, like Chicago did. On forget the about it. Forget about it. <laughs> you know, my great fear about Seattle is that we'll turn into San Francisco. Like San Francisco has the money to do what it wants, but is hopelessly incapable of getting anything done. Like we don't either have the money, or you know, my great fear is that at some point we'll get taxing authority, and you know, like we'll be able to. We'll have the money to build things, but we'll turn into San Francisco. Uh, have you noticed like what works, what doesn't? Like, well, what about the political culture of a city is conducive to not doing the easy stuff, like you know, spending showers everywhere, but actually like you know, taking lanes downtown? Like, how do you, like, what can, how do the cities manage to do that? How do they do it? Like, what do we need to? What about our political culture generally? Do we, do we need to make work. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it, it does. It starts with uh, starts with a strong leader um, that's that's that, that wants to be wants to get that stuff wants to get the stuff done. I believe that. I mean, you know, I think that's it's just going to be it's hard. It's it's bringing people around to that sort of thinking, and, and uh, it's uh, uh, that's a, that's a big that's a big picture. It's out of my pay range. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Netherlands, it started with the people, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's what the story is. So I think that's probably a great time to end, and, and Peter has to actually drive back to Portland tonight, so we're going to let him go. Well, thank you for having me, and um, yeah, keep, keep up the good work. I look forward to coming back. Thanks.